Hi everyone, welcome to Military Mondays. I'm gonna give you a second to, to log in from the waiting room and get the closed captions up and running. There we go. All right, closed captions are coming. All right, you should see the closed captions up and running on the little red box if you wanna follow along there. Welcome everyone to Military Mondays. I'm Christy Baglow, the Director of Statewide Training. I'm so excited to have this series. I can't believe it's taken me two years to have a military and veterans series. And I'm really excited today to have us kick it off with a, with a webinar about veterans cultural competency. So this has been approved for CLE credit. And we are so fortunate to have with us today, Declan Duffy, who's a veterans attorney at, the, at Jacksonville Area Legal Aid, working with the Florida Veterans Legal Helpline. And we also have all the way from California, bright and early in the morning there, Tyler Solorio, who is a policy analyst at Swords to Plowshares, which is one of my favorite organizations. And if I had my way, they would make a franchise in Florida. But until then, we'll have to just uh, be happy they can come give us some trainings. So welcome to both of you. We're gonna hold questions until the end and uh, we should finish in about an hour. It may go a little over if we have more questions. And I did want to mention that there's an all day veterans training put on by PLI this Wednesday, November 3rd. So it's all day uh, Pacific time. So for you all on the East Coast, it'll be 12 noon to 8 p.m. That's a long time. If you can't commit to all eight hours, just register for it. You can watch the recording whenever you want to. I highly recommend it. Tyler will be one of the speakers and several of his, his co-workers at Swords to Plowshares. It's just a great all-day training and it's really geared towards legal aid work. So it's, it's very special now. If any of you don't have access to PLI with their free trainings, you should check with your, with whoever at your legal aid is in charge of memberships, like for the ABA and everything. They should have a PLI free privilege membership, and that should get you into all of their wonderful trainings for free. So you can't beat that. And without further ado, I will pass this over to Declan to start us off. Let me get back to the PowerPoint. Let me know when you're ready. Christine. Is it showing you the closed captions instead of the PowerPoint? Uh, it is just showing me the first PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. I will get myself back over to where I can control the PowerPoint. <laughs> get off the closed captions. Okay, it's hiding the PowerPoint for, from me, sorry. Not sure what I did. Sorry. I'll just I'll take care of it. I can probably stop share and start again. Those captions messed up our PowerPoint. Let me try to start sharing again. Sorry, guys. There we go. Is it back up and running? Yes. All right. Take it away. Okay. Uh, my name is Declan Duffy. I'm with Jacksonville Area Legal Aid. Um, we have an area that covers roughly 17 counties of North Florida. However, we only have offices in Clay, Duval, and St. John's. Um, my project, the Veteran Services Unit, covers most of those 17 county areas. Um, we have had a case from the majority of them. However, 
with where Jala's offices are, in Clay, Nassau, and St. John's, and um, Duval County, that's where the majority of our cases come from. Um, this project is, Jacksonville is home to one of the largest uh, veterans populations in the country, not just in Florida, um, roughly 150,000 veterans living in the 17 county area that we have. Um, if we want to move on to the next slide. Tyler. So I am happy to uh, talk about the organization that I represent. Um, so I am coming in from the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm a policy analyst at Source of Plowshares. So Source of Plowshares was founded in 1974 by Vietnam veterans who were coming back into the Bay and just seeing basically how uh, nobody was taking care of their peers. And so they decided to take the initiative and take care of other veterans. And since then has evolved into a long project. Uh, clearly, we've been here for quite a few decades now, but uh, we are a full services organization. And so what that means is we're taking care of primarily housing. We're a housing first organization. We also take care of employment and training, uh, job placement. We also take care of health and social services, legal as well. And that is specific to discharge upgrades as well as getting uh, compensation and service connection. And then um, then we have me on the small policy team. But basically, you know, a veteran will show up to for any one of these reasons. Maybe they're just looking for a job. Maybe they have concerns uh, about certain stuff. Maybe they're looking to get service connected. But then we also double check and, all right, you're here for this. Is there anything else we can possibly help you with and make sure that you're taken care of? Because maybe there's something that we didn't, they didn't know we could provide for them. And so that's what we seek to do. And, uh, and we do take care of quite a few veterans in the area as uh, I'm certain that you're all familiar, California and Florida are the top two in the nation in terms of veteran population. And then as an aside, we also do combat to community training. And uh, this particular training that we're gonna go through is gonna have elements of that training. And, um, but yeah, and so it's important that we have an awareness of when you're interacting with veterans, what does it mean to have a cultural understanding in a way that informs your communication? And so uh, I'm gonna transfer it back to Declan. And next slide, please. So our task and purpose for this training is to kind of give everybody a broad overview of the military. And when I mean the military as an overview, it's not the specific characteristics and details of each branch. Um, there are many things that are similar training experiences to some extent. Um, combat roles, what is a combat MOS, military occupational specialty, and what is non-combat? Um, doesn't mean they both, doesn't mean one deploys and the other doesn't. I'm going to go briefly over the RAND study that was one of the, um, done in 2016 by the RAND Corporation, um, and it looked specifically at homeless veterans and the issues that they have. Um, then a brief interview, inter brief overview of how to interact with veterans. Um, so as you can see, one of the big issues for homeless veterans are civil legal needs that would have otherwise kept them out of the system or possibly kept them in a home. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So all, uh, next slide. All veterans start off as service members. There's really no other way to be a veteran. Um, Title 10 is the US code that governs over, over military. Um, Section 101 covers all the terms. Uh, as you can see, defines what armed forces are, um, even defines the titles for people um, using the term rank, which itself also has a definition, um, essentially the precedence of order between military personnel. Um, also has the Uniform Code of Military Justice. This would be a big issue for many people who have a uh, discharge other than honorable, or a discharge with conditions that are other than the honorable discharge that would normally have been given um, is usually the result of some uniform code of military justice violation. Um, next slide, please. So what is a veteran? Uh, Title 38 defines a veteran in two parts. The first part being um, section 38 CFR section 101.2. And then 38 CFR uh, 
uh, section 3.1b. And it all comes down to that a veteran is somebody who served in the military and has been discharged other than a dishonorable discharge. Um, go to the next slide, please. So the branches, Marines and the Navy actually fall in together. Um, Army has its own branch, obviously the Air Force since the 1950s has had its own branch. Um, oddly enough, the Coast Guard itself falls under the Department of Homeland Security now, um, and it runs its own part there, but they do get classified as veterans once they leave military service. Um, more recently, we have the Space Force. Um, we make fun of each other. It's not okay for other people to make fun of us. It's gonna be one of the things we'll talk about later. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see, military has its branches um, and things that it all fall under. Um, Department of Defense covers the Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, Space Force, Coast Guard, Department of Homeland Security. However, in wartime, if they are pressed into service, they can be made part of Department of Defense. Um, differences are more than just the uniforms that they wear. Each branch has its own specific goals. Um, for instance, the Army's job is to win battles, win wars, not battles. So it preserves its strength. Whereas the Marines, it's win the battle and they, they go through a lot of, they're willing to accept more casualties than the Army would. Obviously the Navy patrols the deep sea waters and the Coast Guard, the area around the immediate coast of the United States, its territories and occasionally uh, international waters. Uh, the National Guard has its own part-time part of this. Uh, there are reserve components for the, all the active duty branches, um, some of which fall under the title National Guard, for instance, the Air National Guard. Um, they have a different role here. Um, typically, people who people will retire or separate into one of the other branches, especially if they have some service time uh, that's left over. Um, you also have what is called the individual ready reserve, which somebody can retire out of, I found recently. Um, kind of difficult because it requires you to meet specific goals um, every year. Uh, if we could get the next slide, please. So the military cycle starts with enlistment um, all the way to the end of service. So enlistments are different, um, for instance, I enlisted in Germany because my parents lived in Ireland and the German, Ger the bases in Germany have significant numbers of military kids who live there. And if they want to join the military, it's easier for them to do MEPS through Germany than it is for them to have to come back stateside and do it. Uh, basic training is all done stateside. Um, advanced individual trainings may go by a different name. Um, but these advanced trainings are what teach somebody the basics of their uh, chosen career field. Um, then they go to a unit, they do training, they may see a deployment and their end of service. Now that end of service could be a separation from the military because they've completed their contract um, or because they're retiring or for some other reason, such as they're being discharged for an injury or um, too many violations of UCMJ. Uh, we go to the next slide, please. And the next, so what are the common things across all branches? Well, we lessen the identity of people when they get into the military. We shave heads, they only go by their last name. They can only interact with um, specific people in a specific way. Uh, for instance, when I went through basic training, we were not permitted to speak to the other platoons that we shared the quad with. Um, we could only interact with people in our own squad, our own platoon. Um, it's high stress. While well, everything is done and lots of stress is put on individual service members to get them to be where they are. It's an attempt to mimic what may be the stress levels when somebody 
employees. Um, the other big thing is group punishment. So it doesn't matter who left their shoe untied, the whole bay would get tossed over and everybody would have to go fix it. Um, routine and structure, everything in the military happens at a specific time, a specific place, and there are rules for everything, every potential possibility that might exist. Um, we have a chain of command. These are the ranks. They go from the highest, which is the commander in chief, the president, to the lowest, which is typically an E1. Um, typically, the lower the rank, the more likely they have to stand a specific way to talk to somebody with more rank. Um, parade arrest being the most common uh, for amongst in, enlisted personnel and standing at attention for um, officer ranks. Uh, aggression is, is rewarded. Um, that means essentially that if you are louder, meaner, stronger, faster, harder doing things, um, more resilient, and even if you get injured, you're able to carry on despite that injury or getting sick. Um, respect for authority, which is the going in amongst lower to higher. Um, there are cues and things that need to be done. The biggest thing is trusting teams. It's um, essentially the people to your left, right, front, and rear how having to trust them because you don't want to be punished as a group um, to achieve whatever the goals are. It doesn't mean you have to like them. It just means you have to get to the goal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, basic training. These are where the prior slide, the lesson in the individual and all those aggression, team trust, these are the skills that are taught um, focusing people to not think of themselves as an individual person with choices, but to work together as, the, as a team to, to a goal, despite their individual choice. Um, there are core values. Each branch has its own. Um, I'm not gonna go into them because while they are the same, they each have a different acronym. Uh, it is typically a service member's first introduction to the military if they didn't do something like um, junior ROTC or something in school. Uh, military norms, the standing a specific way, parade rest or attention to speak with somebody, going around together in buddy teams, um, being accountable for your buddy, for your squad, for your platoon, and the group punishment for everything. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then we move on to advanced training. These are where somebody learns their specific skill. For me, I, I became a Ford observer, uh, did my training at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, for other people, it could be uh, somewhere Fort Benning, Georgia, or Fort Knox, or Fort Lendingwood. Uh, not too sure where the other branches are. This is where they become familiarized. They learn the basic operations of what they need to do. It'll mix up classroom work with phys physical practical application. And the freedoms that are increased would be, for instance, now you, can, uh, now you can talk to the other platoons instead of just to your set to the 10 or 20 people that you're assigned with. Um, or maybe being able to go to one of the post exchanges, it's like 30 feet from the, the barracks, but that's the extent of your freedom. Um, each phase in the military training, each phase in the military has a specific designation for training. Phase one being in basic training with the most restrictions up to phase five, which is the, the removal of the majority of the restrictions. Um, next slide, please. So then we get to talk a little bit about the different roles. Um, the majority of roles in the military are not considered combat. Um, for instance, the 101st Airborne had roughly 25,000 soldiers, uh, the majority of which were not combat. Um, for instance, a, a rough estimate would have put the infantry units with the 101st Airborne at around five to 6,000 of the 25,000. Uh, the majority of them come in other roles, mechanics, clerks, um, stuff like that. The war on te terror has not 
changed these roles, but it also has not lessened the danger they would have faced. Um, moving on into the future, it's more likely than not that while the differences in roles are still there, what each individual MOS has to learn to train is likely to go up. So why am I bringing this up? Um, because there will be differences down the road. Uh, so we have basic military warfare skills. These would be marksmanship, physical fitness, understanding uh, individual tactical movements. That would be what somebody does to avoid fire, and how a team would operate in the same way. Uh, next slide, please. So what are non-combat roles, ordnance, or master transportation? Uh, they would be drivers, mechanics, communications, fix radios, et cetera, like that. Uh, combat specifically are infantry and armor. Those would be the 11 Bravos uh, or the 12 Bravos. Uh, support combat military would be artillery, which is what I was as a forward observer, medical and engineers. Um, why do I, why do they differentiate these by support uh, combat as opposed to combat? And it's primarily because they wanted to be different. <laughs> um, you know, it was never expected that these support roles would engage in combat, but as military needs have changed, so has the actual needs of the role. Um, next slide, please. So a non-combat MOS, this would, they may qualify, requalify on the basic skills, the marksmanship, physical fitness, um, tactical movements on twice a year, maybe three or four times a year, depending on the command. Combat and support combat MOSs, however, practice these skills daily, um, whether it's moving in a formation, whether it's going to an actual range and qualifying for marksmanship or running through um, what we would call a dummy, a dummy run or a mount area where um, essentially we would conduct urban uh, warfare stuff or, or attack trench line. Um, these are the sorts of things that we would do every single day. Um, they could be from as small as a, a fire team of three people to as large as a division or greater um, movement. There is strict discipline, um, especially when conducting these operations. Um, you know, there was never a, a chance to waver from what the plan was too much. Um, controlled aggression, again. This is rewarded where somebody pushes through. Um, the result of that is often aggression tops out and other emotions, sympathy, empathy, stuff like that kind of get pushed down to the bottom of the line. Uh, combat MOSs um, typically have been trained to result to what is perceived threat. Um, what do I mean by a perceived threat? Well, a perceived threat is something that the service member thinks might be a danger to either him or his um, buddy team or his squad or something larger than that. And the typical response is that you respond to it with overwhelming force and you eliminate the threat. Um, does not play well down the road. So moving on to the next slide, we have commonalities. So you have base life back at stateside and deployed life. So base life, there are things that come first. Um, primarily it's the chain of command, enforcement of the uniform code of military justice. Routines are easier to maintain and compliance to standards. Um, you know, early mornings, late nights. Things are generally more stressful back in the rear because they're trying to reflect a high stress environment like a deployment. Um, problems with some of this is the military itself has an above average divorce rate, um, roughly 3% over the, or 0.3% over the national rate. It is highest amongst enlisted personnel. Um, next slide, please. So when you're on deployment, some things are still there, like chain of command, uniform code. However, routines begin to lack. Um, you know, routine can cause people to be on, to get complacent in 
what it is they're trying to do, um, which if you're on a security patrol somewhere where people are trying to kill you, is not probably the best thing. So in order to keep everybody sharp, there is no routine. Um, you're constantly on duty. You are back to restricted interactions, not with other service members, but with the general wider population. Um, you know, you are in a permanent high stress survival mode. Um, everybody goes somewhere with somebody. Morbid humor is the, the way of life. Uh, there, there's really no way about that. Uh, you can only be in danger for so much before it becomes funny. Um, divorce becomes highest after deployments, mostly because the, the service members have been engaged in a surreal life. Um, it's Groundhog Day. It, days repeat themselves. They look alike. They feel alike, even though there's no routine. Um, however, coming back to the States, it's life has moved on without you. So military experiences. And this will be Tyler's part. Thank you, Declan. I appreciate it. So uh, going over the next few slides, starting off with uh, kind of conflict differences, is there are a lot of things that are obviously similar when we talk about veterans in combat. Um, and there are also a lot of things that are different, uh, substantially different when we talk about between the generations. So um, for the most direct comparisons, talking about the difference between something such as uh, Vietnam era towards early Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, uh, we're talking about deployments for more recently separated veterans tended to be significantly longer than Vietnam era veterans. Um, they also had a higher frequency of deployments. There was a commonality of th 360 degrees of fighting, but then those were specific more towards Vietnam on up. Um, that began shifting earlier on, but uh, th that was something that we started more explicitly see seeing in Vietnam era. And then also with more recent wars, we're looking at urban combat with no clear enemy, which is really important when we talk about things like PTSD, um, and then also change roles. So if we think of conflict in terms of like World War II as organized military forces fighting one another, um, we're envisioning Afghanistan and Iraq as more occupation forces working in line with basically uh, governments and kind of overseeing day-to-day -day security operations. But that's that's not the beginning of the war. That's that's more for the majority of both of those specific deployments. And then also advances in technology, um, especially medicine. When we're talking about the differences of medical technology and taking care of people, um, just in the past century alone, we're talking a vast world of differences. And so this is something that comes up when we talk about things such as traumatic brain injuries. Um, you know, we're talking about traumatic brain injuries being a staple, and that's something that I'll go into in later slides. But we're, we're also talking about the ability to diagnose that, um, which that was something that didn't really exist a century ago, uh, not, not remotely in the same way. And so uh, we're going to play these videos as well. They're, uh, in these videos, these are conflict videos, so there is going to be shooting, there is explosive stuff that's going on. We're not showing any gore, anything like that. Um, but if you need to adjust your audio or stay away from, like, just take a, a moment or something, that's absolutely fine. Um, so let's give the videos a try. If they also don't work out, that's absolutely fine. We can just jump and continue into the slides. Yep, could be because I don't have that subscription I was talking about. Let me let me try the second one. See if that one will play for me. Maybe asking too much. Sorry about that. I'll definitely send the links out with the materials. That is absolutely fine. Uh, that, yeah, we can just skip over into the next slide. All right, um, and so what we're gonna be going on to here is Battle Mine. So I was familiar a little bit of this when I was in the army, but I feel like I became a lot more familiar with this uh, 
actually after I left the military and more actively started doing these type of trainings. Battle Mind was initially a US Army program that was trying to understand how participating in conflict zones essentially, uh, sorry, my cat keeps trying to bust into the room, but, um, and how they essentially keep affecting interpersonal relationships. Now, hold on one second. Apologize. Not only did I mute and turn off my camera, but then my computer froze at the same time. So Battle Mind was seeking how to understand that our interpersonal relationships were affected by conflict zones. The caveat here that I want to mention is that this is not exclusive to veterans who have actually experienced combat um, or like it's not exclusive to the rest of the military. And so what I mean by that is is that the vast majority of service members don't experience combat. But despite that, they actually do end up falling under some of these things that we're talking about. So when I'm talking about Battle Mind, I'm gonna be talking about a whole host of different things, but at the same time, like not every single one's going to apply. Uh, the vast majority could easily not to apply to a particular individual, but there might be one particular thing that does stand out for an individual. And that's important when we talk about that. So now going into it, if I could go to next slide. So starting off with um, buddies and cohesion versus withdrawal, essentially kind of the mindset that we end up getting picked up and ends up really influencing us. And I think, I feel like this one tends to be a, a pretty common one is that uh, a lot of civilians do not understand where we're coming from. Uh, it's mainly our veteran peers that understand where we're coming from. Um, and even then, you know, that can be broken down a little bit uh, between combat and non-combat. And then also fundamentally what role you ended up serving while you were in the military. And so this type of feeling tends to be more explicitly about the squad that you deployed with, uh, maybe the platoon or company that you also deployed with. But it's that, you know, nobody understands what you're going through and it's kind of that shared trauma bonding, right? And I've heard that from other veterans that I served with. It was like, oh, you can't trust your civilian ones, friends in the same way that you can trust the people that you served with. The issue with that is that, you know, that's true to certain elements and that's true to certain degrees. And especially when we talk about trauma bonding and shared like traumatic experiences. But at the same time, that also interferes with our ability to actually establish bonds uh, with civilian friendships, with civilian relationships. Um, and then it impacts relationships that we had prior. So if we're talking about family and friends, and specifically if you tend to be the only person that was in the military that had, had those experiences, um, it becomes challenging because, you know, you might try and open up about those experiences or share those experiences, um, and they might be not interpreted in the same way that you're used to or that you feel comfortable with. And in turn, you just may not want to talk about that. And then that comes off as withdrawal you become more isolated. You don't want to talk about what you've been going through and that can negatively hamper those relationships. Next slide, please. Another form of this uh, also manifests in terms of accountability versus control. So when we talk about accountability versus control in the military, every single day you have a list essentially of sensitive important items that you are accountable for. Um, and so every single day you're checking on those, you're making sure that you've got those, that it's good to go, especially if you're gearing up to be deployed. 
Um, and then when you're going through, we're talking like, and especially in certain kind of training environments or something such as basic training, uh, you're checking multiple times a day. Your leadership at various levels is checking in on you multiple times a day um, just to make sure that you have this equipment. And so it's a bit obsessive and it's also understandable because if you lose even a single item, uh, depending on the importance of that item, they will lock down the base in order to find out that item. So that's like the level of accountability that you are entrusted with. And, uh, and you know, it's military, we play pranks on each other. And so there are pranks that are involved with hiding somebody else's items while leadership comes in to check on them. Leadership's usually in on the plot. And, uh, and this person who has religiously checked for those sensitive items, all of a sudden one goes missing. Um, that does immediately come off as a panic attack or being incredibly anxiety inducing for the person that's having to experience it. Um, but this also has byproducts in the civilian world. If you're having a stressful week, if you've had a uh, just like a rough time, let's say you've had some issues at work and let's say your car keys that you place in the same place that you've always placed in the same place that you always keep counting for um, are missing and you're running late for work your reaction to that might be a lot more intense than uh, the average person's reaction to it. And then if we think of that and tie it in with stuff like the level of aggression that we're tra trained to and a lot of our experiences and any other trauma, again, we can respond what would be seen as pretty inappropriate. Um, and you know, it's one thing if you live by yourself and you're frustrated, but if you are married or you have a roommate or something like that, um, that can easily result in something like a confrontation or being like angry and thinking, hey, I've always kept account for my items. I know where they're at. This couldn't be my fault, even if that's not necessarily the case. Next slide. This also leads into targeted versus inappropriate aggression. We have an expectation in the military that the quietest person in your unit should be able to assume a position of authority. And um, being able to assume a position of authority means that they need to be able to take command, they need to be able to give orders, they need to be able to direct people, and if somebody is pushing back, they need to be able to push back. Um, and it's that kind of presence of force and in the way that we are operating in such a way that we're trying to take care of each other, uh, survive the particular situation, and then also whatever aggression might be necessary to deal with whatever threats we have coming. And so that's incredibly normalized for us. You know, not at one, any one point are we, we really stopping and thinking like, hey, is it appropriate to interact with each other this way? Like there's times where, you know, in retrospect, you're like, yeah, that was incredibly degrading. At the time, you may have not have been thinking about it that way. On the flip side, there's not an on off switch for that. And so when you experience something in the civilian world or you interact something within the civilian world, uh, there are times that you may be overreacting, you might be aggressive. Uh, there might be ways that you snap when you interact with people that leave a lot of folks uncomfortable. I've had this conversation because like I do a tailored employer training um, for like HR folks and everything to talk about veterans in the workplace. And some of the feedback I've received from HR stuff, and I wish like veterans had this conversation or heard this conversation, um, but they've talked about even interviewing, uh, interviewing veterans for positions at a job. And um, and they're like, yeah, they can be over assertive uh, in a way that's uncomfortable just during the interview process. And I'm like, well, I wish they knew that because they probably don't think they're being over assertive. They probably think that they're just really trying to sell themselves and trying to get that job placement. And, uh, you know, you don't really hear people being described as over assertive when they're in an interview process, but I've heard that about veterans. Um, next slide, please. Tactical awareness versus hypervigilance. The ways that we operate in a conflict environment or that we are trained to, um, because keep in mind, a lot of drill sergeants, at least in my experience, did have combat training and, well, not combat training, did, did have combat experiences and they imparted their experiences with those they were training, whether they experienced combat or not. But there's this mentality of survival and this mentality of awareness where if you are complacent, um, that is lethal. That is something that will either get you killed or prevent you from somebody else getting killed. And so our survival depends on us constantly being aware and stuck in the stage of awareness. Now, when we are in a conflict zone, uh, it works for us, right? Like that is something that is keeping us safe, Have, being constantly vigilant, being constantly aware, that is something that is protecting us. Again, it is also one of those things that does not have an off switch. And so especially when you come back into the civilian world, 
uh, you start noticing a lot more. Nobody feels like that they have PTSD when they're in a conflict zone, right? Um, they start noticing that they have PTSD when they're back in an environment where they are not worried about it because that's when it really starts popping up. And so that's when we really see hypervigilance come into play. Next slide. And then emotional control versus anger and attachment. The military is genuinely, and like this is a, a byproduct of discipline really, but you do learn how to handle your emotions, not in a healthy way, but in a way that it doesn't interfere with how you operate because there are a lot of times when you are in life or death situations or high risk situations where, you know, obviously you might have an emotional response. If somebody you care about in your unit gets injured, you're going to have an emotional response, but you know that emotional response is also dangerous. So you need to actually reel that in, take that like for a moment and just put it aside because you have to be able to operate to the best of your ability. So you can't deal with those emotions at the time. And, um, and in a lot of those situations, it is do or die. So emotional control really does end up prevailing. Um, and this is the third time I'm gonna say this, this is another thing that does not have an on or off switch though. This is a natural survival mechanism that gets embedded within you. And so this can uh, affect interpersonal relationships in a lot of different ways. Um, and especially it's like, hey, this emotion might screw with me and my inability to survive, I'm gonna put it to the side. And so, uh, you know, events that I could think of this in particular is if a family member or a loved one dies, right? Um, and let's say you are in a work position where it's like, you don't have any time off, you don't have any opportunity to do that. You have a busy work week ahead of you. You gotta take care of all these other tasks, right? There's so much that's already on your plate that's going on that you gotta take care of. Um, and yeah, this hurts and yeah, this sucks. But if this emotional process takes it over for you, it's going to make your life that much harder. You're going to be like, all right, then I'm going to put it to the side. I'm going to do my best not to deal with it and push it to the side. It doesn't mean that you're not experiencing it and that it's not happening. But everybody around you is going to be interpreting it as such. They're going to be wondering why you're so cold, why you're so detached. And it's going to be harmful uh, to your relationship, ultimately, to your friendship, ultimately, because they're interpreting you as being uncaring when that's not the case. Um, the reality is, is that you're doing your best to survive and that comes off as you not caring. And so there, that's one of those things that we got to work with and we got to find uh, middle grounds to be able to express ourselves. But then also, again, it is a survival mechanism and it is a useful mechanism. Next slide. This also uh, relates somewhat when we talk about operational security and secretiveness. There's a lot of times where uh, you're operating on a need to know basis. Um, you might be operating in something with some that might be towards confidential. There are also other experiences that you have that are not necessarily something um, that you are being uh, secretive about or that you have to hide, but there's just no reason why you would talk about it or it would seem weird that if you talked about it. Um, but when this is a huge chunk of your life, you know, keep in mind, we are doing this job for years. Um, and so when there are huge chunks of your life where there's things that you do not talk about because you're not supposed to, or just why would you ever bring it up? Um, that's your life you're not talking about. That's, that's you being quiet about important life experiences that happen to you and something that you can't necessarily share or vent about with, uh, with other people other than maybe the people that you served with, right? And, um, and again, that reinforces the notion that we are isolating, that we are socially withdrawn. Um, maybe that we are cold, like, why are you so secretive all the time? And again, this is another thing that could potentially be damaging to interpersonal relationships. Next slide. Mission accomplishment versus failure. Uh, military does everything it can to teach you that you are fully capable of achieving anything, um, that there is so much that you can put your mind to and that uh, you, you can accomplish, right? And basic training, I feel like, uh, really tries to instill that mentality within you. Um, and, you know, it's to the extent that they expect where it's like, hey, you can accomplish this even if ultimately it completely eradicates your physical health, right? And then there's also not really room to embrace failure or learn about accepting failure. Like there might be to like minor degrees, but obviously um, they, they wanna prioritize you can do whatever you set your mind to. Um, this creates a lot of challenges for a lot of different veterans in a lot of different ways. Uh, I regularly see this manifest most when we talk about student veterans. 
Um, there are some veterans who, you know, they get out, they get the GI Bill, and their first response is like, all right, you know, I'm going to put it to use, I'm going to jump into school. Um, and then, but maybe they uh, assume too much about school, maybe they assume where their standing's at, uh, maybe they think that they're just ready and good to go, and they just need to put their heart into it, right? Um, but that's not realizing, hey, like, you've not been in school for a few years, there's things that you're actually going to have to relearn, uh, it could be particularly challenging. Um, but then, so they go into these situations, they end up putting themselves in classes maybe that they weren't capable of doing from the get-go, that maybe they needed to take, uh, you know, slower steps up to. And, and then on top of that, um, maybe they're also uncomfortable with asking for help because they haven't had new civilian friendships or relationships in a while or interactions in a while. And so they don't want to go to tutoring, anything like that. They're just like, all I have to do is just try my hardest and I'll be fine. And, um, and that doesn't always work. And then that's a recipe for failure. And then if you end up flunking out your first semester out of school, that might deter you from ever trying to continue school again. And so that that's another thing that we got to balance and juggle out. Next slide. Individual responsibility versus guilt. This is kind of the embodiment of survivor's guilt, uh, which I feel like permeates for a lot of us. Um, like we are really instilled with kind of this team ethos of keeping each other alive, of uh, doing everything we can to take care of one another, that we're responsible for one another. The military is one of those places where I feel genuinely like I can think of situations of people who I deployed with, who I did not like, who I did not care for, right? Uh, who I may have even hated at times, right? But I was like, I'm responsible for that person's livelihood. And that to me was just completely unshaken where it's like, no, I have a responsibility to this person. And, uh, and so, that mentality is not exclusive to your time and service. It is something that permeates far beyond that. And so when you do hear situations like service members that you are with uh, end up, uh, unfortunately, let's say committing suicide or dying in a way that was preventable, your gut reaction is going to be, maybe there was something that I could have done. Maybe there was a way that I could have taken care of this person. Like maybe if I had been talking to them, I could have changed something. And, uh, and that, that responsibility that you have for other people and the responsibility of people that you had that you deployed with, um, it, it's powerful and it's also incredibly harmful uh, in ways that if we can't understand it in a healthy manner of like, hey, no, there was nothing you actually could have done um, and we need to reconcile with that, then that's something that has a great impact, I think, on a lot of veterans. And next slide. Lethally armed versus unarmed. So usually when I talk about this slide, I talk about it in the context of California. Um, it does very obviously different in Florida, but I, I feel like general like interactions as people working with veterans, um, there, there's a kind of understanding that we have to approach to this. Um, there are a lot of veterans who only feel comfortable if they have a means of protection on them. Um, and so that can be in the form of carrying a knife, that could be in the form of carrying a firearm, you name it. The issue here is, is that there's a lot of legal stuff uh, involved in what you can carry, when you can carry, how you can carry it, and what situation. Um, so in California, like, there's no open carry out here, right? Um, if a veteran shows up to one of our offices with a firearm, that's going to be a concern. Um, and, and the same thing when we talk about if they are not armed, there's actually a huge degree of anxiety that comes to be associated with that. And so, like, you know, I can say for myself, my first year back, like me having a firearm in the house personally did help with my anxiety and made me feel more comfortable. I didn't carry it outside of the house, but that was a reality where it's like, no, it made me feel more comfortable. Um, but for some people, it's a lot more severe and either that's gonna interfere with how they seek services um, or if it's potentially a crisis situation, something that can endanger their own lives, um, even if they weren't planning on doing anything with the firearm. If police are responding to a crisis situation to a veteran and that veteran happens to have a firearm, um, that might endanger that veteran um, from the police response. And next slide. Non-defensive versus defensive driving. This is the last part of Battle Mine, and this is the part that I was hugely guilty of as a person who was a driver in Afghanistan. Um, when you are driving in these kind of zones for 18 hours a day to 24 hours a day, uh, and you are driving erratic, you are driving into oncoming traffic, you are driving in a variety of situations that you would never ever drive civilian side, um, that's, some, that's a habit that's hard to break. That is a habit that is pretty internalized and, and something that, uh, 
that takes a bit to wean off of. And so like, you know, I did that for a year straight in Afghanistan. My first year back from Afghanistan was perhaps the most amount of times that I've ever been pulled over in my life. Fortunately, that's something that I have like broken out of and it's not really a big deal. And, and like, you know, there are good elements to it where I feel like I am a safe driver. Um, and, but at the same time, again, I was pulled over frequently. On the upside to this, I think this is one of the things that law enforcement had actually picked up early up on. Um, and so this was one of the things that they tended to be uh, more lenient in regards to veterans and understanding, hey, like you had to drive this way while you're over there. I understand why you're driving this way kind of now. And so elaborating, elaborating a bit more on defensive driving, next slide. Uh, I'm thinking we probably won't be able to play these videos either, which is absolutely fine. We could just go into next slide and I can explain um, the other stuff. So like, there's a lot of different ways of which driving and what it can look like for us, right? So uh, in this particular situation, if you're driving in an area that is crowded, there are not many avenues for escape. Uh, if you are going slow, like through this area, um, this could potentially be a threat. Uh, in a variety of different ways. Next slide. Uh, this feels like something that could potentially be an ambush spot for a veteran who's driving in this. And then also depends, like, you know, the longer you are separated out from service, um, these aren't responses that you're necessarily probably going to have. Um, but I would argue that veterans that are more recently separated uh, are the ones that are more at risk for having these more intense responses to, to these particular situations. Um, you know, we're taught that hey, everything that's garbage on the road is something that's potentially a bomb that might detonate and kill you, right? When you have actual PTSD that is related to IEDs, um, it's hard to kind of separate the two from each other, right? Because you're back home and now that is how you are actually seeing it, where it's just like, yes, this happened to me. Yeah, I'm still gonna be looking at the things as potential threats, right? Um, and then next slide. Actually, back a slide. I forgot that we didn't have this other slide. And then Declan, uh, if you would like to start. Yeah, um, so you see there are some of the concealed positions and improvised explosive devices to the left and right of the PowerPoint. Um, some of the other things that, especially a combat veteran, somebody who's trained with 11 Bravo uh, infantry or Cav Scouts, forward observer, something like that, would see more than just these particular things. Um, they would probably see snipers on top of the building or the fact that there's no cover here there's no there's no cover here it's just something that cars that they could get behind and from experience cars do not protect you from incoming fire the way they do in movies just to note that um typically not a good place to be so you know a, a combat veteran who's served in a combat role is probably going to have more anxiety and issues as it relates to even just driving and, and through a parking lot um, or being in crowded traffic, stuck in traffic than someone who hasn't had those experiences. Um, if we could move to the next slide. Um, so what happens when somebody gets back from deployment? Um, well, for a lot of guys who just are in for one term to get their GI Bill, that's the end of their service. Um, to get out, they become a veteran, and they start trying to come back to a normal life. For somebody who's retiring, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, there are lots of things that go on when people are deployed. Um, there are a lot of things when they come back that the world has moved on while they're still the same. Um, I like to liken it to how most people feel about COVID now. Uh, it was a year that didn't really happen because not much happened during it. Um, if you can move on to the next slide. So we have types of stereotypes for veterans. Um, you know, Rambo being the most common one, uh, especially for combat soldiers, um, that we're dangerous, that we like to control things, and we are angry and you know, one spark away from igniting all the time. We don't have any emotions, um, uh, heavy drinkers partiers, and we can't stop swearing, um, which is probably more true in my case than I would like to admit. Uh, next slide, please. So what is a veteran? Um, as we had said earlier, it's defined in 38, uh, 38 CFR section 101 and uh, section 3.1b. 
So, but amongst veterans, it's somebody who agreed to do something for our nation that could have resulted in the loss of their life. Um, move on to the next slide. So one of the big issues, well, physical issue, physical injuries um, being one of them. It's primarily what the VA is was initially developed for after the Civil War um, and has since become more involved with uh, mental health issues that relate. So what do physical injuries result in? Well, one of the things that I learned when I was in the military is that if you're experiencing pain, then that is what we called weakness leaving your body and you were going to be stronger for it. Um, does not quite apply so well if somebody's broken their ankle and they try to finish a 21 mile road march. Uh, just saying. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, you know, this is physical injuries, loss of limbs, burns, other disfigurements, munitions being trapped in their body. Uh, I know several people who have fragments of IEDs or bullet rounds uh, stuck in them becomes problematic, especially if they go to get an MRI, uh, because MRIs are magnetic resonance imaging machines and they like to pull on those metal parts. So it can cause bigger things. Um, we also have concussions and blast injuries. Um, these are the result, of, not necessarily, may not result in, uh, you know, an actual amputation or, uh, or an injury in the way that we think of it, but the concussive wave that comes out of an explosion is actually the part that kills people, not the uh, shrapnel and stuff that comes around with it. Um, also have a lot of soft tissue injuries, pulled muscles, torn ligaments, uh, stuff like that, especially around the rotator cuffs and the lower back. Um, stress fractures are also a big thing. The stress fracture is a weakening of the bone um, where it begins to essentially break in small portions, not enough to be a clean break, but may result over time in the limb actually shattering itself from the inside. Um, fun fact about the light infantry, they carry roughly 200 pounds of gear. Uh, the average infantryman weighing is somewhere around 160, 170 pounds. And that weight has not changed since ancient Rome. Uh, next slide, please. The mental health issues, these are the parts that everybody likes to pretend don't exist until they really, really do exist. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So traumatic brain injuries. Um, these are often the result of blast injuries and the concussions um, from the, the wave, blast wave of the whatever ID or something um, passing through somebody, it essentially rattles the brain and the brain stem. Um, you know, it has been defined as caused by a blow or bump or jolt to the head, suddenly and violently when, um, but may or may not require an object to pass through the skull. Uh, it is the signature wound of global war on terrorism, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, they may appear to resolve quickly. Um, that said, even a minor concussion that does not result in somebody losing consciousness increases their likelihood of, of experiencing another one down the road. And as these things begin to accumulate, the, the injury itself gets worse. Um, so it can be something as simple as starts out as a headache and the headaches become migraines and the migraines continue for days um, instead of resolving themselves you know, with a night's sleep or whatever, um, causes sleep disorders, which in turn relate to other problems, increased anxiety, uh, depression, um, slower thinking. Uh, as I said, you know, because these things become cumulative, they can really result in people becoming more, less capable years down the road than they were immediately after the, the whatever the, the initial event was. And they can impair everything from somebody's ability to retain employment, to their family relationships, and even coming back into reintegrating with their um, communities. 
Next slide, please. We have post-traumatic stress disorder. May also have symptoms that are similar to those in traumatic brain injury. Um, it is something that is often, they often get misdiagnosed or diagnosed together. Um, anything can cause post-traumatic stress. Uh, ultimately what comes down for most veterans is there was some event during their service that they keep reliving even if they don't realize they're reliving it. Um, not all of the post-traumatic stress require somebody to go into a flashback of being back in the actual situation. It may just be a feeling, um, a smell or a sound that strikes them back as, you know, hey, this reminds me of this place or this event. Um, often veterans and like most civilians may try to um, self-medicate or engage in reckless behaviors. Self-harm, uh, gambling, mismanaging money, um, and suicidal idolation be actually common. It results in um, roughly 22 veterans a day giving their lives uh, or taking their lives. If we can have the next slide, please. Military sexual trauma. Um, same definition as is used by the Equal, uh, Equal Economic Opportunities Commission. Um, as you can see the definitions there, it is often most likely to be reported by female veterans. However, uh, male veterans are starting to come forward about it. Um, it often goes unreported specifically because of the uh, loss of, potential loss of any military career. Um, and there's a stigma that you're selling out the person to your left or right for something that you're having feelings about. Um, so uh, as you can see, one in four assaults generally reported. Often nothing is done because the military itself has a, a specific way of dealing with these things and often the uh, perpetrator may be in the chain of command of the victim. Uh, it becomes detrimental down the road when the veteran tries to apply for services with the VA based on military sexual trauma. If it was not reported and even if it was reported, whether or not there was any subsequent actions taken by the uh, command. Um, typically it appears to have a larger impact on symptomologies than any other trauma. Uh, next slide, please. This is a particular issue, um, moral injury. It crosses all lines. Um, the big difference being that with earlier generations, uh, Korean, World War II and Korea, they had time to process what they did overseas. Um, you know, it was months before they would, before a World War II veteran would make it back after the war had ended to his hometown. Whereas with modern technology, um, you know, a veteran can be in Kabul or Baghdad one minute and mere hours later be home with his parents um, with no time to process what is going on or how it's going on around there. Um, it often is something that, you know, a veteran, they may not have had to do something, but simply watched as something else happened. Um, and, you know, because of their, their role there, that's, that was what was required of them to survive. They, moral injury relates to PTSD and um, as the others do as well. But it doesn't mean that the person is going to be cured of their moral injury. It's more personal to them than uh, re-exercising or, or you know, talking through an event. It's a, a personal thing within them that goes against their own personal beliefs that they did and they failed to succeed and live up to, which is also aggravated by the service member's own ability to the military. We don't like, we don't like failing. Um, so if you failed yourself, it's even worse than if you failed your friends. Um, so can, next slide, please. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the uh, roughly 22 veterans a day were taking their, their own lives. 
Uh, here in Jacksonville, we have the firewatch.org. They are an organization whose goal is to help reduce, um, if not completely eliminate veteran suicide. Um, and it's not more than just a helpline. It, it kind of, they ask for people to get involved and say something. Just a simple, hey, are you okay? Is often enough to, to stop that. Um, so as you can see the likely more frequently it is the newer generation of veterans for global war on terrorism who are more likely to take their lives. And this could be a result of a multitude of factors, but often it may be simply that they didn't re reach out for assistance when somebody realized that there was a bigger issue going on. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So we move on to the RANDCOR uh, study. This was conducted by uh, RANDCOR in 2016. It was a, essentially a request to see what the needs of homeless uh, veterans were. So it also found that California, Texas, and Florida having the top two uh, or top three um, veteran populations with less than 70,000 veterans uh, determining <laughs> first, second, and third. Um, you know, Jacksonville ties with Colorado Springs and Virginia Beach for the highest density of veterans and where veterans are likely to retire to. Uh, Florida and California having the highest percentage of homeless veterans. Top major issues being for male veterans are ID cards, um, child support being a large one as well, um, housing, proper identification, criminal records, um, discharge status. Same for females. Uh, typically, the biggest issue for females is not just simply finding a secure housing for themselves, but also a secure housing for children, um, which makes it a little bit difficult, a little more difficult than, than normal. Uh, next slide, please. And the next slide. So many people believe that Every, if you served in the military, you have access to, to healthcare, and that's not always um, true. When veterans get out of the military, they have lost their access to better pay healthcare and the fringe benefits of service, such as having somebody pay for your housing or having on-base housing where your housing is not just paid for, but all your utilities. So if somebody gets out of the military and there's a child support order, in place, they have substantially reduced their available income because they did not re-enlist or they were retiring um, than they otherwise would have had had they remained in. Uh, big issues that result, result in a suspension of license if enough um, child support is, has accrued and has not been cleared out. Housing issues, it's not just the retention of housing or getting into housing, um, but it's actually learning how to be in there again, um, to be by yourself and not have somebody watching your back all the time. Uh, consumer credit issues, foreclosure often happen to military because they're they've lost the, the more pay they the, they fail to realize or account for. Um, early intervention in all of these areas can result in fewer veterans entering the criminal justice system each year. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we engage with veterans? Well, first you have to realize what veterans have left. Um, everybody in the military has a rank. Everybody in the military wears that rank on their, their clothes. They also wear their last name and their unit. Um, you can identify a military service. Even civilians can identify a service member, even if they don't understand what that service member is or does, whereas veterans, have been trained and intuitively know um, what each rank means and where they stand in relation to everybody. They also know their role, um, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to stand, how they're supposed to talk. Um, they understand that, hey, uh, I know I might not like A, but A also has to keep me alive. So I have to keep A alive, even if I don't trust A with you know, my stuff. Um, when you get out, you lose that identification of yourself, um, who you are and where you stand in relation to the world. Um, 
what it is that you're supposed to do. And when you look at other people, how you're supposed to interact with them. Um, you also don't know if they are with you or against you, or if they are somebody you can trust, or if they're somebody you just have to trust. Um, you can go on to the next slide, please. Coming back to the civilian world, the perception is one of the most difficult things is networking. Um, veterans often see uh, civilians as thinking, we're damaged, we're broken, we're Rambo. Um, we don't have an ability to control ourselves. Our ability to control ourselves is just strange and a little too extreme. Um, in 2018, 7% of US adults were veterans. Um, that's down from almost a fifth in the 1980s. Many veterans, when they get out, they desire to not engage or inter interact and engage with the military or anything related to the military. Um, this has a bifold problem. May compound mental health issues by not having them treated immediately uh, when the symptoms are small enough that they could be managed. Um, and also in networking. Um, networking is the key to getting a job in America. You can apply for all the positions that are out there, but if you know somebody, you're more likely to get the interview. Um, you know, there's a perception of negative care within the VA system itself, uh, not assigning fault one way or another, but it is something that the perception is there that the VA is going to take forever. And, you know, the reality is that sometimes it does take a long time to get processed because there are a significant number of people using the system. Um, a lack of adrenaline, uh, everything in the military revolves about being done now. So everything has a, a moment of purpose and it must be done immediately. Uh, when you're deployed, you go from being on a normal level to your highest level of adrenaline. Uh, on a daily basis. And when something happens, it spikes even higher. Um, many, when they come back, find life is a little bit more boring and they start to engage in some of those reckless behaviors that we had mentioned earlier. Um, driving, you know, how to uh, be in the most particular. Um, many veterans also feel lack of control in their life. You know, I knew where I was and what I was supposed to do in the military and how move forward, now I have to figure it out for myself and there's just too much. Um, next slide, please. So how do we engage with veterans? Well, veterans come from all areas, all backgrounds, um, but we also have our own thing, uh, our own culture. It's good to be knowledgeable of specific terms within the military, um, the jargon, uh, differences, especially between enlisted and officer experiences. Um, for most enlisted people, they were there on the ground um, being the ones handling whatever the situation was. Many officers, are, if they're not a lower level officer, may not have been on the ground itself. Um, it's good to locate local community veterans groups. There are more than just Wounded Warrior Project and Veterans of Foreign War and American Legion or Vietnam Veterans. Um, I find more each and every day. Um, you know, it's good to interact with the, the um, officers of these organizations and to find out what it is that veterans actually need. It is always better to engage in a one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, than it is to try to do a phone call or Zoom. Uh, next slide, please. So in, when engaging, it's always better to be direct. Blunt answers are generally prefer preferred because you don't like to waste time. Um, try to keep on track and on point about things, uh, being factually relevant to the, the issue at hand, not necessarily letting them move off into the, the other areas that they might have. Um, also ask them about the resources they've accessed. Often, sometimes they, they haven't accessed resources that they know are out there. It might be a better way for them to achieve their goals. Um, actively listening, being able to follow along with what they're saying. Um, often you may come across some experiences that you don't understand. Um, you know, it's difficult to say what it's like to be in a dangerous situation, knowing you're in danger every moment, but 
finding yourself dealing with some kids on the side of the road and still trying to um, suss out if there is a danger in that position. Um, you know, it, judging experiences, it's hard to judge something that you couldn't comprehend. Um, if there is a response there, it's often better to um, let them engage it, but then de-escalate it. Um, don't allow the, the emotion to control their answers. Um, avoid politics. It's hard to tell with everyday people, the civilians, whether somebody is left or right or whatever in the center. Um, it's even more difficult with veterans. There's a perception that if somebody is a specific type of person in a specific area, they fall within a specific demographic that may result in them favoring one party or one team over another. Um, and if you're wrong, it may get worse. And they may actually dis decide not to engage with you any further just based on that. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. So often we get thanked for our service. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means different things to different veterans. Um, it's, as I was told by one veteran, it was like being thanked for paying his taxes. <laughs> um, something that he felt he was obligated to do and did, um, it wasn't for the accolades that came with it. Um, this was a particular thing that I found on one of the veterans memes that I'm with. Um, you know, thanking somebody for their service isn't as important as being an American worth fighting for. Um, and that kind of stuck with me. So um, with that, I will let Tyler say his farewells as well. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for everybody for being here and attending. Uh, fortunately, I do see that we also have some questions uh, in the Q&A that I think we'd be interested in talking we about. We do. Thank you both for such a good presentation. I, I, I'm so grateful to both of you for putting so much work into this and kicking off the series with this topic because it's absolutely essential for veterans to do this training uh, themselves. I can talk about veterans cultural competency, but I'm not a veteran. And I just want to remind everyone that we are all serving veterans, whether that's your specific project or not your clients are veterans. So I think we owe it to them to educate ourselves and try to serve them the best we can. So thank you both for, for being here. Let's get to questions. How do you handle interactions with veterans who have experienced discrimination based on race, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera? Uh, I'm happy to jump on that one. Um, so, to give an idea, so at Source of Postures, um, a significant portion of the majority of the veterans that uh, we end up working with are Black veterans. And if you know the demographics of the US military in general, you know that um, it's probably one of the widest sectors of government service. Um, we're talking, it tends to predominantly be upwards of 60%, uh, primarily white demographic. And so when I say something like, hey, the majority of veterans we take care of are Black veterans. Um, that's saying that we're taking care of a smaller percentage that's, that is being completely overrepresented uh, in particular things such as houselessness. Um, but we're also talking about an intersection of trauma in a lot of different ways. And so they're also Vietnam era veterans. And so not only were they drafted into uh, an unpopular war, dealing with the trauma of that war, dealing with the racism of their peers, and then dealing with a lot of system, uh, systemic racism at the time that contributed to a lot of problems that are, have been ongoing since. Um, but it shapes how they access even the most basic things as VA services. And this happens across multiple groups um, and in a variety of different ways, uh, like talking about women veterans, accessing the VA and kind of the challenges that go with that. Um, I just had a conversation recently with Native American veterans where I asked about an office in their region, like, hey, do you, do you go and access this? Do you try and use them for services? And they're like, if you're Native American and you walk in that office and you try and get services, they will ignore you until you leave. And basically they were like, you, you are only gonna get services there if you're a white veteran. 
And, you know, not just speaking on that racism alone, but then also knowing that Native Americans are the most overrepresented group in the military. Um, there's a lot of ways that informs them and prevents them from wanting to seek resources. Because if you have a bad experience in seeking resources, that's going to inform every attempt you make in the future about seeking those resources, regardless if you're entitled to them, uh, if they'll help you or anything. It burns people out on wanting to access those resources. So as a baseline, uh, developing relationships with community organizations and kind of building a rapport with that and establishing rapport is probably the most important thing. Um, a bad rapport will damage you for decades. A good rapport is going to guarantee that folks know that they can come to you and that they are safe in your hands and that you're gonna advocate for them. And, and unfortunately veterans uh, compared to, I would say any other group, we operate on word of mouth. Uh, for a lot of different things. If I know a veteran has gone through an area and has a good experience, um, that's going to make me more inclined to choose the avenue of approach that they chose. If a veteran's being like, no, I had a bad experience for these reasons, I'm probably not going to end up accessing whatever avenue of approach that they talked about because I'm going to take their word for it. And, uh, and so I think that's kind of like the biggest hurdle when we talk about veterans that have experienced its discrimination is right from the get-go, your reputation, your rapport is going to matter the most but then let's say, you know, in spite of that, you're having these interactions, um, just doing everything to, you can to emphasize that you're on their team and you're going to bat for them. Um, and not that they're just having kind of like the shallow interaction, but that you're, you know, active listening, you're engaging, like when they share those experiences, you're acknowledging those experiences and like reciprocating that conversation. I, I think that's what you have in lieu of if you don't have the rapport already. Thank you. COVID notwithstanding, I completely agree with Declan. It's important to meet with your veteran clients in person if you can, especially if you're going to be handling a case for them for years. You've got to establish that rapport or your case is not going anywhere. I'm not sure if you guys will have um, any stats or comment about the next question. Um, this person wants to know which veteran age group, like which combat war era, receives the higher portion of medical care versus mental health services from the VA? So that would probably be the global war on terror. Um, most veterans who get out now engage with the VA almost immediately from the onset of getting out. It's part of the, the transition program that the military has when somebody leaves. Um, you know, older generations, especially um, Korean War, uh, they were less likely to go seek this sort of assistance. Um, they figured it was, while it was available to them, it wasn't something that they needed unless they were actually an amputee or they were injured. Um, it wasn't until, you know, late 90s, early 2000s that, th that those particular age groups started to engage to receive medical assistance and health services, mental health services from the VA. Um, Vietnam veterans typically just did not engage with the VA because right from the get-go, they they had a bad they had a bad um, interaction with somebody at the VA or their benefits were denied, so they just chose not to. Um, and it was something that you know it is a bad feeling that has remained with many Vietnam veterans um, having to rely on the government or the VA for anything. Um, yeah, it's global war on terrorism, long story short. That makes a lot of sense. And I just, when you're meeting with someone who served in the military, don't assume they have VA healthcare or any benefits, no matter their age, there's still rumors going around about who is and is not eligible. Um, female veterans sometimes think they're not eligible for some reason. Um, so definitely ask, because in places like Florida, if they don't have VA health care, they most likely do not have any health care. So make sure you ask about that. Um, so the last question I see is many of our clients are aging veterans, age 70 or older. Your recommendations seem directed to more recent veterans. Do you think they equally apply to the older veterans? Yes, without a doubt. Um, it was something that my mom's cousin he was a vietnam veteran and he and i we had an instant rapport um he had served in vietnam i had just gotten back from my first tour of duty in iraq and he was somebody i could relate to because he understood what it was like to be a 
deployed, gone for a year, come back, and the world has moved on without you um, while you've been in a place where your life is in danger every moment of every day, even if it's taking a shower or eating at a chow hall. Um, there was just some level of uh, shared experience, regardless of the war era, uh, that makes it easier for veterans of all eras to talk to each other that they would not have talked with family members about. Um, it's, yes, the, everything Tyler and I talk about are as both attorneys and veterans um, of the more recent wars than older, but it's equally applicable to all eras. Sometimes history repeats itself. Um, you know, there's still a lot of veterans, the younger and the older veterans who got kicked out with other than honorable discharges after combat tours, same things happening now. They're probably not going to get into VA healthcare for that reason. They may become homeless, have substance abuse issues. So history does repeat itself. I did have an Iraq veteran tell me back when I first started practicing veterans benefits that when he wore his Iraq veteran hat, people would cross the street to avoid him. So it still happens today, probably because there are not as many people serving in the military. So um, thank you all for taking the time to educate the rest of us. Um, about how to better serve our veteran clients. It's been so, so helpful. And thank you for kicking off this series. Don't forget to register for next Monday's webinar about non-citizen veterans and the naturalization process. And we'll have two more after that. And if anyone has questions about how to become accredited or anything, feel free to reach out to me. I'll send my email address along with the slides and the recording and hopefully the video links. Sorry, those did not work. Um, after the webinar, I did want to remember to announce the CLE number is 21083730 and as in Nancy. Again, it's 21083730 and as in Nancy. Thank you so much again, Declan and Tyler. Hope everyone has a good afternoon. You too. Thank you. Take care, Bye. everybody.